Hey, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I labored with my first son, Killian, for 33 hours. For more than a day, the, the rhythmic heartbeat of my unborn child beeped in the background while doctors and nurses and midwives employed their bag of tricks to get him out. Infertility is a fairly common problem, and we had some losses before Killian. I remember the first time that we knew Killian would be. We went to have an ultrasound, a process we were familiar with. Nervous and scared and hopeful, we looked at the black and green screen. And the tech smiled and pointed and asked, do you see it? And we looked and we said, no. She pointed to one flickering pixel, the sign of life we'd longed for. He had a heartbeat. It was beautiful and amazing, a miracle. When finally he was born, we were brought to our room. My husband had been with, up with me the most of the time, so he went to sleep. I was lying in my bed, looking at my unimaginably perfect baby in his clear bassinet, and I wanted so badly to hold him. But Ryan was sleeping, and the nurses weren't around. I looked around like a cartoon bandit, and when the coast was clear, I did the only thing I could. I reached over and grabbed him by the swaddled blankets and picked him up. His poor little head dropped back, and I was like, I'm doing this, and put him in my arms. Years of waiting had culminated in this moment, and I was not going to allow anyone or thing to keep me from holding my baby. My world felt awash in miracles. The new baby, for sure, this perfect little human that had all his organs in this tiny seven-pound body, but also my body, the body that I loved and hated in all the complicated ways that we live in our bodies. My ordinary and imperfect body had grown this child, stitching him together month after month. How could someone so ordinary, one of the billions of people living on the planet, do this extraordinary thing. You know, though, God has a way of using ordinary people and things to do and teach and show the extraordinary. Jesus and his friends are being followed by a large crowd inspired by his healing miracles. As they head up a mountain, Jesus asks Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Philip replies, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. You can tell that the disciples are trying to figure out this problem. Andrew reports that there is a boy with bread and fish. Bread and fish are ordinary things. This was probably the boy's lunch. And Jesus takes the bread and fish and offers thanks to God and distributes it to 5,000 people sitting in a pasture and there was so much left that the extra filled 12 baskets. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels. The writers of the four Gospels had different interests and different audiences. Scholars can argue about anything, but generally it is believed that Matthew was written for the deeply religious of the time, uh, proving to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Luke and Acts were written for the Gentiles, people new to the faith. Mark was really writing for commoners. The Gospel of Mark has a comparative ease about it. There's a lot of sentences in Mark that start with and, the way that when you're telling a story, you might just keep adding ands. Those are the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three that are most alike and probably referred to one another in the writing. John is the outlier. It was written later for converts and for the devoted Christians, people who had committed to Christ. John is more mystical and poetic than the other Gospels. 
So generally, our three-year lectionary draws from Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and John. This year is a Mark year, so most of our Gospels come from Mark and John. Because each Gospel has a slightly different audience, the stories they include vary somewhat. But this story, where Jesus fed so many people, this is the only miracle that they all include. Why is this story so important? What does the feeding of the 5,000 tell us about God? Our spiritual ancestors believed that this told us something so basic, so essential about God, that they all included it. And not only that, but every third year we spend five weeks talking about it. Jesus takes bread and fish, maybe the peanut butter and jelly of their time, and makes it Thanksgiving dinner, an abundant, overfilling meal where there is food left over. God meets our hunger not just to fullness, but beyond imagination. But miracles... Well, they have a way of becoming ordinary over time. We get used to them. Or we don't believe they really happened that way. It couldn't be, right? It's too big, too extraordinary, too amazing. The authorities saw the miracle on the hill that time when 5,000 people ate their fill. And for a minute, they were truly amazed. But then Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And instead of dwelling on the miracle, they lean into the truth as they know it. Is, the, is, not, this Ju, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we knew? They know Jesus. They knew him before the miracle. They knew Jesus when he was knee-high to a cricket. How could he be the son of God? I don't blame them, honestly. At some point, I got used to the miracle that my husband and I created some 12 years ago. Sometimes that miracle even gets on my nerves. <clears throat> but back then, in that hospital bed, in the wee hours of the morning, holding my teeny tiny baby, I was shaken by how much I loved him. I know this isn't true for everyone, that birth and hormones and circumstances can be complicated, but for me, I felt a knee-buckling love for him the instant that I saw him. And there would never be a container big enough, words or thoughts or feelings, that could hold the chasm he broke into my body. And as I looked at him and my heart felt more than I knew to hope for, I had a shocking second revelation that my parents love me that much, too. And it changed my relationship with my parents forever. I carry myself differently now. And finally, that this overpowered love was but a tiny, imperfect sample of the love of God. Sometimes it takes ordinary things to help us see the extraordinary. God didn't love us more that day when 5,000 people sat on a hill with Jesus. But that day, that miracle shook us into seeing what was true all along, that we are loved so perfectly that even, even when we have our fill, there will be 12 baskets left over. And it is easy to get dull to that miracle. The miraculous story about God's indefinable love for us, it can be the story that makes a preacher's shoulders droop when for the third week we have to find something new to say about it. But a few years ago at a clergy gathering, our bishop was giving us a pep talk about preaching, and he said, just tell the story. The story is this. Jesus used a kid's lunch to feed 5,000 people on a hill. And he used their eyes and ears and stomachs to feed their hearts with the truth, capital T truth, gospel truth, that God loved us so much 
that we can get our fill and still, still have some left. God's love for you and for me, it is bigger and more perfect than we have imagination for. God came fully human and fully divine and lived as one of us. And Jesus' sole mission was to embody God's love for us, for humanity. It is the knee-buckling love that makes us carry ourselves differently. Jesus used an ordinary lunch to teach us about the expansiveness of God. God uses ordinary bodies to bring us miraculously into this world. May we, ordinary folks, be used to God's extraordinary purpose, spreading abundant love to those we meet along the way. Amen.